Stable Diffusion recently released their 1.6 update, which comes with a host of new features and improvements on previous versions. This video will act as a refresher on what the options under the text to image section of the user interface do, so you have an easy reference on how the various options can impact your work. Drop a like before we begin and subscribe if you're one of the 86% of people who have not yet subscribed and consider supporting the channel through the links in the description below. But enough chit chat, let me give it to you bite size. So we have our prompt box where you enter the text that will be used to generate the image and there are different ways to structure your prompts from brewery tagging to writing but this is where you will describe the things you want to see in your image. For example, we can type in a couple of prompts and get a corresponding image depending on what we typed and how Stable Diffusion interpreted our prompt. The negative prompt is the opposite of your prompt section where you describe the types of things you do not want in your image. This can range from telling Stable Diffusion to not include bad anatomy, certain colors or even a bad quality image. But the results you get are entirely dependent on how Stable Diffusion interprets the information and the effects can be weak or strong depending on what you described. So negative prompts aren't a one-stop shop solution for all image related problems. The update provided us with some new samplers, but what is a sampling method in a non-technical sense? It's how Stable Diffusion takes a very noisy image and clarifies the image, bringing it closer to your description. And this is often determined by your sampling steps, which is the number of times the sampling method will produce an improved version of the image. And the higher this value, the cleaner the result and the lower the value, the more noisy the result. So for a practical comparison, you can see in this image how a step of two produces a very noisy image, which could be anything. But as we increase the sampling steps, we get a cleaner and cleaner image, which is more accurate to our prompt. The reason we have multiple sampling methods rather than one sampling method is because each sampling method uses a different technique for denoising an image. Some are quicker but produce worse results and some produce better results but are slower. I won't go into each sampling method in this video, but I'll likely do a separate video testing them so there's a dedicated resource for seeing how they look. But I would suggest using whatever sampling method your chosen checkpoint has recommended as they will suggest the best option for that particular checkpoint in the event you're overwhelmed and need a place to start. So you may be wondering where the restore faces and tiling options are located as they've moved locations since the update. You can find the restore faces option under the settings tab under restore faces. The tilings option can be found in the settings tab under the stable diffusion option and you can add these back to your user interface by navigating to settings, user interface and adding them as part of the options under main user interface as seen on my screen. Now what do these options do? Well restore faces is a method for correcting anatomy issues with a character's face and works better on realistic images rather than anime ones, although many prefer the after detailer extension to restore faces. Tiling allows you to take an image and make it tileable, which means to seamlessly repeat the image next to itself without telling that it's an individual image, a bit like a jigsaw puzzle without the seams which define the shape. This can be useful for making game textures like dirt and bricks. There are some important changes to how high res fix operates and the tools you have at your disposal. First, there's no enable box for high res fix. It's activated when the tab is open and deactivated when the tab is closed. So be careful when you have this open or closed. You have additional options which are hidden by default, which you can find under settings, then user interface. The first one is called show checkpoint and sampler selection. And the second is called show high res prompt and negative prompt, which we'll cover in this section. You have the option to select an upscaler within high res fix which is how you can improve the resolution of an image. This differs to samplers because while samplers convert noise to a clear image, upscalers take a clear image and make it even more refined, often by adding new pixels to an image by calculating the surrounding ones. Different samplers have their own benefits and disadvantages and you can even install ones externally from Stable Diffusion. But for the sake of this video, I'd suggest using the one your checkpoint recommends. Upscale by will determine how much the image's resolution should be multiplied by when using the upscaler by multiplying its original size by a value we determine with the slider or text box. Then we have resize width and height too, which allows you to directly specify the size of the upscaled image. If this is left at the default value of zero, it will upscale the image 
based on the upscale by value, where you can specify a number for the multiplication. High res steps lets you choose a number of sampling steps to be used when using high res fix to upscale the image. And if the value is set to zero, it will use the value chosen for your sampling steps for the high res steps. The technical explanation for the high res steps is the same as the sampling steps, which will produce an overall less noisy and cleaner image at the cost of longer generation times. But following on from high res steps, you also have the ability to choose a high res sampler. And similar to the high res steps, it's a separate location to choose which high res sampler you will want to use independent of your sampling method. These high res samplers work in the same way as the sampling method, and by default, it will use whichever sampling method you have selected, unless you select one exclusively for the high res fix. We then have our denoising strength, and this determines how closely the upscaled image created through high res fix should resemble the original image created if high res fix was never used. A lower value of zero will get you an image which is almost identical to the image you would have received if high res fix was not enabled, while a higher denoising strength will make an image which is different to the original. This can be useful when combined with options such as the high res checkpoint or prompt for high res fix, which can change the way your image looks during the high res fix stage of the image generation process. You have the high res checkpoint, which will allow you to use a separate checkpoint during the image generation process. This can be useful if you wanted to change the style of an image by mixing it with another checkpoint when high res fix is being applied. The denoising strength can control how much the high res checkpoint impacts your image, so it's worth playing around with the value to ensure you get the changes you want. Here you can see the results of using absolute reality combined with dark sushi to create this image, which beautifully blends the realistic art style with the anime art style. Lastly, continuing with our theme of modifying your image during the high res fix phase of the generation, you can use a completely different positive or negative prompt during the high res fix to modify your image further. There are many reasons as to why you would want to do this, such as modifying your image in a way that achieves a slightly altered result, but it's worth experimenting to see how this may be useful for your individual cases. Another new feature is the refiner, and what this will allow you to do is swap checkpoints during the generation of an image when a specified fraction of the sampling steps are reached. To accomplish this, we have two values we can work with. You can select the checkpoint and then specify a switch at value, where 0.5 will switch the checkpoints at 50% of the way through the generation and 0.1 will switch at 10% of the generation, with 0 never switching checkpoints at all. As you can see, we get a different result depending on when we use the switch at value, and this can circumvent the need to combine or train checkpoints to achieve a different style. The width and height determines the size or resolution of the image being generated, and I'd advise using values of 512 or 768 as starting points, then upscaling where required. Batch count determines how many sets of images you will generate by multiplying the batch count by the batch size, while batch size determines how many images should be generated in a single batch. So if I have a batch count of 2 and a batch size of 3, I'm generating 2 sets of 3 images. The CFG scale will determine how strongly the image generated should conform to your prompt and how much it should be completely unrelated to your prompt. Most checkpoints suggest the ideal CFG scale for that particular model, but keeping it at a modest value between 5 to 9 tends to lead to the best results. The seed is a random number which determines which variation of your generated image you will get, and using the same seed should give you the same image each time you generate providing you don't change any of the other settings. On the topic of seeds, this dice icon will set your seed to minus one, which is a value that will select a random seed each time you generate an image. The green recycle option will reuse the seed from your last generated image, which means you won't have to copy and paste the seed from the image's file name. The variation seed allows you to select a second seed, which can be combined with your main seed, for the purposes of combining two separate variations of the same image into one. You can see both our original seed, the variation seed, and then the combined image in this example. The variation strength controls how strong the blending is between the two seeds, with a low value giving you the image from your seed, and a higher value mixing in more of the variation seed. When you change the height or width for your generated image, it will also change the variation of the image you get even when you're using the same seed. 
To avoid this, we can use the resize from width and height option, so even if we change the resolution of our image, we can use the variation we got from a different resolution. Stable Diffusion also allows you to utilize custom scripts and comes with a few installed for you to use. I've done videos on XYZ plot, prompt matrix and prompt from file or text box, so review those videos to understand how these scripts work. You then have two options that show up when you generate an image called interrupt and skip. Interrupt will stop the generation of all images, while skip will only skip the generation of the current image, then move on to the next one, while generating multiple images through methods like batch. The blue arrow icon will read and apply the prompts and settings from your last generated image, providing the prompt box is clear of any text. You can also use this to take generation data copied into your prompt box and apply it to the appropriate fields. The bin icon will delete both your prompts and negative prompts from the text box, but your settings will not be deleted. The styles box has undergone a change where you can now create styles in a much easier way by clicking this pencil icon and entering your prompts alongside the name for the style and pressing save. You can also now delete or edit your styles all within this window, which is an amazing improvement to the feature. When a style is selected from the drop down list, it will be applied at the end of your prompt by default. You can apply the contents of a style directly to your prompts by using the notepad icon within the style itself. Lastly, you can use the name of the style in curly brackets to specify a position for that style within your prompts, similar to how wildcards work. This will give you a greater degree of control over your prompting when saving styles you like and applying them to your work. You then have a classic image box, which is where your generated image will show up when it's complete. You have a few additional options when you click the image, such as toggling the zoom view, previewing the image through tiling, and saving the image to your computer, and exiting the zoomed in view. You have the folder icon, which is used to open the directory where the image is located, so you can access all image types from here. The save disk icon will save your image and an Excel spreadsheet of the generation data to Stable Diffusion's log folder. This is different to the output folder where generated images are automatically stored. You then have this filing cabinet icon which is used to save your images into a zip folder with generation data, similar to the previous option but with a zip file. The canvas icon will send your image to the image to image tab, which is where you can modify an existing image using prompts and other options. Lastly, the ruler is used to send the image and its generation data to the extras tab, where you can access upscaling and other options you have installed which use that tab. But hopefully this video is helpful, and if it was, consider subscribing, liking the video, and supporting through the links in the description. This is Bite Size Genius, and I hope you enjoyed.